Sean flipped the sign. Yeah. Okay. That's very hard. Good evening. Shall we get started? I say we should get started. It's about time. Thank you for coming. Uh, this is the Rust Meetup. I hope you're in the right place because things are going to get very rusty. Uh, my name is Mate. I'm a software engineer at Braid. A um, couple of things. The presentation will be recorded. If you don't want your face to appear, please let me know and we'll try to figure it out. Uh, it's also very unlikely that you're going to be in the video if you're sitting behind the camera. So you're probably good there. Another thing, once the presentation is done, we will have pizza on the tables over there. And we also have free beer in the far back corner of this area. Also, if you are not in a rush after the presentation and the food, please help us return this area to the original state. Mm -hmm. uh, it will involve moving these tables and the chairs. And special thanks to Braid for helping organize and host this event. And please welcome Brian Heisey, who will tell us about full stack web development in Rust. Giving my computer a moment to wake up. Or is it going to come up at all? Ah, oh, there it goes. Okay. Just a moment here. Let's see. Oop. Oh, it's not on. Uh, just a moment. I don't have. I have mirroring turned on. I have to get that shut off. There we go. That's a little bit better. my notes. Okay, all right, sorry about that. So yeah, uh, full stack web development in Rust. Uh, thanks for coming out tonight, everyone. Uh, and uh, I hope it's more than just for the free beer. Uh, so anyway, um, yeah, a little bit about me. So my name, as Mate said, is Brian Heisey. Uh, I'm a full stack web developer and consultant at LifeRay Japan. But that's not particularly related to this because I don't use Rust at work. I actually learned Rust in my free time, just kind of as a hobby. Um, and naturally, because I'm a full stack web developer, what I ended up learning was full stack web development. Um, I've been doing it for about you know a year, just kind of working on little side projects and experimenting and learning. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. And uh, my GitHub handle is Toadslop. If you're interested in checking out anything I do, there's not much to see there other than random side projects. So, and, and also a uh, a demo. Um, uh, full stack web app, which we'll see later. So if you want to see some actual uh, code in Rust, building a front end and a back end, uh, you can check it out. So um, who are you guys? I want to get to know the audience a little bit. Um, so first of all, th who all here has um, any experience at all writing Rust code, uh, even if it's just like on a hobby project? OK, good. All right. Now, throwing Rust aside, who would consider themselves a web developer? Front end, back end, full stack, doesn't matter. OK, good. And now, who has done any full stack web development in Rust? Again, even hobby projects. OK, we got a few people who can fact check me. If I get anything wrong, by the way, feel free to let me know. So to start with, why Rust? Why use Rust for full stack web development? After all. As we know, uh, Rust is a systems language, right? That kind of puts it in a class with languages like C and C++. Um, we don't normally think about systems languages for uh, web development, right? Of course, systems languages have some clear advantages, things we love in web development, like being fast, 
and restores efficient. But they have a few disadvantages too, especially C and C++. They're, all, they're pretty easy to um, write in bugs that can be big security issues, and uh, especially the manual memory management is quite error prone. Um, so typically what we're writing in languages like Java or JavaScript or Python, um, languages that have a garbage collector, they protect us from those kinds of, um, those kinds of problems. And we just, take, we just accept as a given that um, we're going to have slightly less or sometimes significantly less performance to get that safety and reliability. Um, Rust's difference, though, is that we can be fast and resource efficient while still keeping our security and um, also our memory safety, as I'm sure most of you already know by now. So you can have your cake and you can eat it too. Um, so let's start with back end, right? Um, why use Rust on the back end? So what are some common requirements for back ends? Well, we really value security and reliability because we're often working with customer data. And if our customer data gets out, credit card numbers, other private information, our customers won't be happy and they might not come back. Um, another thing we need is reliability, right? If our server goes down, no one can use our app. If you're like Amazon, for example, and you're doing you know, millions of dollars every minute of trading and you're down for a minute, that's a lot of money lost. Even a smaller company, that can be significant. We also like resource efficiency because we pay for our resources, at least if we're using Amazon. If you're on Heroku, maybe it's not your problem. But if, you're, uh, if you have to pay for the compute time you're using, you want your app to be efficient. Resource efficiency means low cost. Uh, finally, low latency. Right? Our users don't want to wait. Um, very often, if someone has to wait more than a few seconds for your page to load, they're going to navigate away, and they're never going to see the great thing that you made. Um, and some types of apps, right, latency can kill your app. If you're talking like real-time uh, video calling or video games, uh, latency will absolutely make your app unusable. And what makes Rust great is it can provide us all three of these things. So first of all, Rust is very secure and reliable, right? It has, a, uh, it has static type checking that increases reliability. Right? So we can eliminate entire classes of errors at uh, compile time. Now this doesn't make Rust special. Right? Java has that, Scala has that, C++ has that too. Uh, although Rust does have the advantage of no nulls. So that can save you from the pesky null pointer exception. Um, but Rust is also memory safe. So it can eliminate the memory related errors that most li systems languages have. But it does it a little bit differently than other languages. Most other languages give us memory safety as well through a garbage collector. Rust does it without the garbage collector, which ties into um, our resource efficiency. Um, and finally, it's thread safe. This also ties into resource efficiency, but we have compile time thread safety guarantees in Rust. So you can write really fast multi-threaded applications without having to worry about fuzz testing them um, after you've, you know, a while they're actually running. This also um, yeah, is, ties into resource efficiency. Um, and so, just to reiterate, right, Rust enables resource efficiency. No garbage collector to eat our resources. We have fine-grained control of memory, um, but in a, in a safe way, thanks to Rust's borrow checker. Uh, we have safe pointers um, that reduce needless data copying. Uh, there's also a concept called move semantics that means copying is always explicit. So we know when we're copying, and if we have a problem, we can go back and figure out how to prevent that copying from happening. And the, although there is a runtime, it's small and very simple. So all of this is going to translate into resource efficiency and therefore lower costs. Finally, Rust also enables us to write very low latency code. Um, so we do have low level hardware control as a systems language. Um, we don't have to deal with garbage collection pauses like some other languages. Go, of course, is famous for being one of the most fastest garbage, co garbage collected languages, but it also, those garbage collection pauses have had impacts on real production applications that needed to be addressed 
You don't have that with Rust. Um, finally, it's, or next, uh, the thread safety gives us better multi-core utilization. And thread, uh, making a multi-core application is not going to um, reduce the reliability of our application as it can in many other languages. Uh, and finally, Rust also supports asynchronous um, runtimes, so um, we can process data while waiting on I.O. Very few languages, I think, have all of these features rolled into one. This means we can have really cut down latency on our application, on the back end anyway. But after hearing all these good things, you might wonder, well, do you really need Rust for your back end, right? Is it a, a must for my next project? And the answer to that is uh, you, you probably don't need it, actually. Um, to bring up a good example, like Ruby. Ruby is the opposite of Rust. Ruby is slow. It's garbage collected. It's dynamic. It doesn't have static type safety. Anything that Rust has that, that is Rust's advantage, Ruby does not have. And yet some of the best apps, that some of the most successful apps that have ever been made were made in Ruby, right? SoundCloud, Airbnb, Hulu, and Shopify. Uh, just to name a few, and even Twitter uh, was originally implemented in Ruby, although they did run into Ruby slowness eventually and had to migrate to Scala. But that said, if reliability, resource efficiency, um, at, or latency, or any of these are critical to your application, you should really give Rust a, uh, a consideration for your backend language. Let's look at some real REST success stories on the back end. So I think we all know Figma, right? I think almost anyone who works in the web development space knows this app. It's, we use it for uh, uh, designing the application. We can share our designs uh, from, with many people. And in fact, we can be in different sides of the world, share the same design, and work on the same design document together. As you can imagine, latency can be an issue in a situation like that. And in fact, they had that exact problem, um, particularly when it came to saving files and um, loading files. They were ha having sometimes some significant delays to get things uh, going. So as you can see from the graph here, uh, they managed to significantly improve the performance of their application by writing. They didn't replace the whole thing, but they rewrote part of it in Rust, the, the most problematic part. And as you can see, peak average um, memory usage per worker uh, um, is 3.8 times smaller in Rust. Uh, peak average per machine CPU usage um, was six times smaller. And peak average file serve time was 10 times faster. And peak worst case save time was 16 times faster. Uh, that, well, the numbers speak for themselves. Another example is Discord. So Discord had their server written in Go originally, but as I mentioned before, they had troubles with the garbage collector. Um, these graphs here show these pretty regular spikes on almost every point, and that's the garbage collector. Um, and that was impacting the service they were providing. They rewrote their server in Rust, and again, uh, the, uh, <laughs> the graph speaks for themselves. Um, while on three of the graphs, we see the Go is spiking up and down regularly. Rust is pretty consistently low. Um, so, yet again, um, the results are pretty obvious. By the way, the sources are in here. We'll share this later, so you can read through them if you want. Um, one other example, sorry, no pretty graph, uh, but Cloudflare uh, replaced Nginx uh, with a custom Rust proxy. Now, for those of you who don't know, Nginx is the industry standard for a fast server, and it wasn't fast enough for Cloudflare. Uh, they replaced Nginx, and with their own custom proxy, they had a five millisecond reduction in medium time to first byte, and 80 milliseconds on the 90th percentile. So in the 95th, in the 95th percentile of worst cases, it was 80 milliseconds faster. Uh, it also consumed 70% less CPU, and 67% less memory. Again, a clear win. So, but there are some reasons not to use Rust on your back end. So, one is, of course, it's hard to find Rust developers, right? There's not so many out there. We've got maybe a lot of them in this room, 
But uh, in the grand scale, if you need a lot of Rust developers, it's going to be harder to do. And not only that, Rust has a notoriously steep learning curve. So if you have to train people to use Rust, that's also going to take a long time. These translate into, of course, higher expenses. Uh, and it's also a relatively new ecosystem. So a lot of the open source packages that you would expect to have, well, a lot of them are there, but some of them aren't. Right? You can't just count on it to be there. If you're working in Java, for example, and you need a, a uh, I don't know, a, a library that can r read PDFs, it's probably there. In Rust, you better check first if you need that for your application. But what about Rust on the front end? Now this is, I think, the most interesting part of Rust because I know many of us web developers, when we got into the business, we were told there's only three languages that run in the browser. CSS, HTML, and JavaScript. And only one of them is useful. Uh, and only barely so. So anyway, but actually there is, of course, a fourth language now that's available in the browser. Every major browser now supports it. Does anyone know what that language is? WebAssembly. Yeah, of course, WebAssembly. And Rust compiles to WebAssembly. So yes, um, you can write uh, code in Rust and run it in the browser now. Uh, not only that, um, bindings to JavaScript APIs and browser APIs exist. Practically speaking, this means that anything you can do with JavaScript, you can do with Rust now. DOM manipulations, you can do data fetching, you can do event handling. Um, and also, Rust can communicate with existing uh, J JavaScript code. So you can actually write bindings so that you can access like node libraries and um, other web JavaScript libraries from your Rust code. Uh, but of course, the, the most useful thing be about being able to run Rust in the browser is the speed, right? Um, this enables us to do things in the browser that we could never do before. JavaScript is pretty fast for, a, um, for an interpreted language, but it has its limitations. You want to make a video game that has graphics that's better than Minecraft? Good luck getting that to run in the browser until now. Uh, you can probably get something as good as an Xbox video game running in the browser now with WebAssembly. Um, maybe last generation Xbox. Um, but in any case, now we can do games in the browser, um, encryption, data visualization, many things that were not possible. This is what makes using Rust for a full stack application most exciting to me because you can do stuff that has never been done before. And this is the main thing you really want to think about, especially if you want to use Rust on the back end, or on the front end, sorry. Um, another perk of Rust on the front end is you can finally have native type safety, right? With TypeScript or Elm or Kotlin, they transpile the JavaScript and you lose all your types at runtime. So any protection that you had is, it's only there at compile time. After that, you know, deserialize a JSON and who knows what you're getting, right? So there are two main models for how to do Rust on the front end. You can use Rust alongside JavaScript, right? Use your JavaScript for the standard stuff that JavaScript is good for. Your scripting, your event handling, your DOM manipulation, write your UI in React or Vue or Angular. And just use Rust for really uh, heavy uh, performance intensive tasks. That is probably the best use case for it. But you can just use Rust. You can throw away JavaScript and literally write everything in Rust. There are um, UI frameworks. Um, none of them are quite production ready yet. It's a very new space. But you could, if you wanted to, make your entire front end Rust. And well, good luck if there's a feature that you need. Uh, because again, things aren't quite fully production ready yet. So I would really recommend against doing it for a production application. But it's a worthwhile space to pay attention to because hopefully it will mature. And maybe one day it will be very wonderful to never have to write JavaScript again. Um, here are some reasons not to use Rust on the front end. There's, as I mentioned, lack of production ready frameworks. This really only applies to using Rust to build your entire UI. Uh, the existing frameworks are good. I used one in the sample app I'll show you later. But uh, yeah, there are rough points. And all the frameworks, as they release new minor versions, they're breaking stuff and breaking stuff because they're really in that early stage. So keep that in mind. Uh, a really, really big one is slow compile times. 
you think compile times are tough when it, you know, it takes time on the back end and then you run it and test your code or whatever. Imagine when you have to visually see the change you just did. Imagine changing one CSS class and you want to see if the div got centered. You got to wait 30 seconds or a minute to check it. Right? That's tough. That means you have to rethink how you actually do your front end. You have to get in the browser, get in the dev tools, figure out what the right CSS is and then put it in and hope you got it right. Because anyone who's used to front end development in JavaScript knows that JavaScript translation is really fast. It happens almost instantly. And it's painful to just sit there and wait and wait and wait to see if your change actually did what you thought it was going to do. Um, Another good reason is, well, there are even fewer development, uh, developers experienced in this area than in vanilla Rust, right? Uh, if Rust developers are few and hard to find between, Rust developers who understand um, how to program in WebAssembly is, are even fewer. There's a lot of little tricks that can get you. Uh, even as an experienced web developer, I can tell you, there are things that are going to throw uh, trip you up, like trying to do asynchronous fetching in Rust for the first time. It'll, bother, it'll, give you, uh, it'll give you a few tricks, that's for sure. Um, and uh, another big one is no code splitting. So as we know, uh, the bigger our front end is, the more code we ship um, on the first page load, the longer it's going to take. In JavaScript, if you have a really big single page application, we, we can break it up into small pieces and only send out the part that is going to be used um, on the first page load, and then if they want to like click on something and something dynamic happens, we can load the code for that later. That is not currently possible in WebAssembly with Rust. Uh, it's a feature that we're hoping is going to come around eventually, but uh, it's not there now. And WebAssembly binaries blow up in size really big. The application I'm going to show you when I later is very small. It's just two pages. When it compiles down, even with the best optimizations, it's 600 kilobytes, which is three times bigger than the, than the uh, recommended minimum size for a front-end bundle. So keep that in mind as well. Um, finally, less documentation and examples, right? This is such a new space. Y if you have a problem with this and go on Stack Overflow, you're very likely not to find the answer that you need. And if you ask a question, you might not ever get an answer. I think that's true with regular Rust too, but it's worse with Rust on the front end. So you better like figuring things out because you'll have to do that a lot. But uh, now let's talk about the big picture, a full stack application written in Rust. What are some advantages of that? Why would we even care? Well, these are a little bit more superficial than the other reasons, but um, in one case, uh, the, the top one for me is you can share code between the front end and the back. So thank your data entities or your data validations, right? In the past, you would have to write those in your back end language and in JavaScript. And then if one got updated, you had to update the other one. Now, this problem was sometimes solved by using code generation. So you write it on your back end language and generate the JavaScript. But now you can literally have it on both sides. You change one and it's recompile your code, it goes into both sides, and problem solved. Uh, you, you'll see that demonstrated in my uh, application later. Uh, another one, this is kind of a small gain, but consistency for those of us who like it. Uh, having a lang one language to rule them all is kind of nice. Uh, I know I originally learned programming in Ruby and Rails, and I moved to Node because I wanted to have the same language on the front and the back. Um, so yeah, for those that like that, uh, that's a good reason. Another one is uh, being able to manage your whole project with Cargo. For those of us who are Rust developers, I think a lot of us have grown to really like Cargo. It's a really nice tool to use. And to be able to just manage the whole thing with Cargo is also rather nice. So uh, let's go take a look at the demo now. Um, so let's pull up VS Code here. We're not going to look at too much at the, um, the source code, um, but we'll just take a quick look to get an idea of the structure of this, uh, this repo. So uh, we have a, a backend folder. Um, the backend, of course, contains the server. It's written in a framework called Actix Web. Uh, it's known to be one of the fastest web frameworks out there. Um, so the next folder down is the database. Uh, it's implemented using a, uh, a crate called CORM, which is an asynchronous uh, ORM. Um, and 
Oh, yeah, uh, in that one we demonstrate not just, um, we demonstrate migrations, uh, also entity generation, and um, also seeding the database from a CSV and also from random data. And then on the front end, uh, we use a framework called U, which is similar to how Elm works, uh, but if no one's programmed in Elm, it's also pretty close to React. It has functional components, um, you know, uh, hooks, use state, use effect, that kind of thing. Um, and finally, this shared folder here just has a few like configuration things that I share between the front and the back. Um, quick look at the cargo.toml. You can see this is a workspace. Uh, so we have our members here, but you notice I excluded the front end. That's because the front end has a special uh, WASM optimized um, release target. And so uh, because the, the um, like the, the release configurations and everything need to be consistent for the entire cargo workspace. In order to have a different one for front end, we have to actually exclude it, but we're still able to, um, we're still able to make everything work. Uh, so let's get the thing started. We're using a tool called uh, Cargo Make um, to get everything, to set together some scripts so we don't have to um, start the app, like start the front end and back end separately. So that's it, we're up in production mode. So let's take a look. Uh, working at 8,000. So uh, yes, for those of us who like beer, it's a very poor clone of uh, the Rate Beer website. Um, as you can see, it's not gonna win any, any um, awards for uh, design, but you know this is a, a Rust demonstration, not a CSS demonstration. So, here we have a uh, list of beers. These were, again, seeded from a CSV file uh, into the database. Um, and when we click on one, you can see we have dynamic routing up here, right? This is a single page application. Um, we get to see the detail with a nice little image and uh, you know, some, here are the comments you can see, the reviews. These are randomly generated um, using a uh, Rust trait called fake. RS, kind of similar to Faker JS, but I think slightly different history. And uh, we can post some data. So my name is Brian. Um, let's say I, I like this beer a lot. So let's. Uh, I like it. Okay. And submit it. Okay. So, and just to show, we're actually persisting things to the database. We can go ahead and shut this down. Start it back up again, and refresh the oops, and refresh the page. And yeah, you can see it, I like it; it's still there. Um, so yeah, this was all made in Rust. So now coming back to the code, uh, we're not going to look more deeply into the individual lines of code in here unless you want to. We're coming into the question and answer phase. So you can ask me anything and I'll try my best to answer, including if you want to get a closer look at anything in here and how it's done, please let me know. I'll show you and explain what's going on. Okay, yes. I'd like to see like, uh, the request handler. Okay, so he asked to see the request handler. So let's go, where's my mouse? Here we are. Okay, so you mean on the back end, right? Okay, so a request handler in, um, let's see, we have the ad review and also the all beers. Which one would you like to see? How about the ad review? Ad review, okay. So here we have a, uh, a review handler. Let's get this out of the way a little bit. Oh yeah, I left in a, a debug comment. <laughs> um, but yeah, so this is, as you can see, it's asynchronous. Again, this allows your, um, your Actix application to be processing other requests as it's also processing this one. Um, we have here, these are what's called um, extractors in um, Actix lingo. So you literally can just, um, can just declare these in any order and set them with a proper extractor parameter and um, Actix will deserialize all the information out of your, um, out of your request. In this case, the path will allow you to get path variables. Um, the, uh, let's see, the rating, that's gonna get, of course, the body here. We're using a web JSON, and then review model. 
review model is what the model uh, that was generated by CORM. And also we have some app state that's actually just has our database handle. Um, and once we get down here, we just grab our beer ID and our database. Uh, and I have a, a special place where I handle all of my database stuff to try to keep a separation uh, between what's the back end and the database specific like uh, implementation. Afterwards, if that went out okay, uh, we get the result and we can just match on that. And you can see we have this nice enumer enumeration here. So I can say, okay, it was created, send back the review, or if there is a problem, I can send back the error as a string, at, or well, JSON technically. Uh, good? Okay. Um, and you had a question? Yes? Uh, frankly, it just you is the only one that I've really spent time working on, and so having only a short period of time to build the demo, uh, rather than learn something totally new, I, I went with one that I already kind of knew. But you is also um, famous for being pretty close to React, and I do a lot of React at work, so that's also another reason. Um, uh, out of curiosity, actually, have you used any of the other ones? Yeah, he was, so he says he's used Dioxys. I've actually not used that one before. Um, and he wanted to know whether mm -hmm. I w had compared any. And yeah, I, I haven't compared any. And just know that when you check them out, like they're all below version one. Um, but they are worth playing around with. They're quite interesting. All right, anybody else? Ah, yes. Oh, in the, in the browser? So this is what you want to see? Okay, so it looks like nothing is there because we haven't had it open before. So let me know what you want me to click on. And oh yeah, he asked to see the network tab, by the way. <laughs> yeah, you can see I'm using Bootstrap. <laughs> uh, now you notice there's some JavaScript files coming up here, right? Uh, these are sort of like some bootstrapping files that are necessary because currently you load WASM through JavaScript. Um, so that's what those are for. This one is an automatically gen some automatically generated code that kind of glues all the, the Rust WASM stuff together. And there's our WASM file. What's the first on the left? Uh, yeah. Up two. Uh, so, well, that's the. Um, the Not the last one, up two. Oh, one. up two here. That's in. Up one more. Oh, this one. It's taking a long time now. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm not sure what's going on here. Um, because this is just, uh, it, oh, it could be something from the, um, uh, from just the, the web server that I have running. I just have a simple web server. And uh, what this here is just is the query parameter. I used uh, like the to link the um, or to get the beer and its reviews. I'm using the the sort of expand pattern where if you want a, a, an entity and its child, you provide an expand um, parameter. Um, and yeah, I'm not entirely sure what's going on here, but it probably is just something that my my uh, web server is doing. I have a, a static uh, web server called uh, Simple HTTP Server which is implemented in Rust, actually. Like, if we go back up to here, you can see, um, you can see, uh, where is it? Yeah, yeah. So this is uh, our simple HTTP server. It's just serving static files. And if it doesn't get a file that it recognizes to serve, it serves index.html, which is how we end up not getting a 404 uh, when we're doing the SPA routing. Uh, yes. The rendering. Ah, oh, right. Okay. Yeah, this is really interesting, actually. 
Um, so of course we know in React we have JSX, right? Um, some people love it, some people hate it. Um, and U has a similar answer to that. Uh, but they use, um, what do you call it? A, um, a macro, right? So here we have the HTML macro. And this actually parses out the HTML. And um, so you see it just looks like normal HTML up through here until, well, you see you have these little curly braces here. It, in order to put a string in, you need curly braces. It's how the, it identifies things that it should, um, well, you can put Rust code in too. Like here you, you see we have this um, curly braces here. And we have our iteration as we make another um, a line for each beer. And we have, you know, your, as you would expect, like an on click. Um, the beer.name knows that we drop in a, a reference for that. And uh, some formatting to make it look like a percentage or whatever. Uh, yes? Uh, how do you generally decide the rest code in the Ah, yeah. So there are a couple, there are two main things. Uh, one is there are um, bindings for the console, right? Uh, there's a, pa a library called glue console that makes a nice Rust you know, user friendly like interface over those bindings. And you can just, I think I have it um, in, in this package. But basically, you can just do glue console colon colon log exclamation point and then log something. And anything that can be turned into a string can end up logged in. So implement display, implement debug, you can turn it into a string and log it. Um, another useful one is there's a crate called the, um, what is it, the abort panic hook or something like that. Uh, and basically, that will make it when a panic happens, it will uh, like send the output and the stack trace to the console. If you don't use that, you just won't get anything. Like your app won't work and you'll be like, what's going on here? And there isn't really a manual telling you that you need to do that. It's one of those things you gotta figure out as you go along or hear it from me. Uh, oh, yes. Oh, yes, yes. Um, yeah, so he asked if, he, if I felt it was really type safe. And the truth is, anytime you're interacting with the browser and JavaScript APIs, th there's a high chance of failure because those things aren't type safe and they're going to give you what they're going to give you. But Rust, you get all the advantages of Rust's error handling capabilities in there. So, for example, these known to be failable, possibly failable actions always send you back a result and you have to handle that result. So, if you request you know, I wanted a HTML input element and I got a div. Well, it requires you to check it. If it's a failure, you have to think about what happens if it's not correct, you know, which might just be logging something to the console or you could display some different, maybe some kind of error state in your application. But in contrast to say doing it in JavaScript, you're under no obligation to handle the error in JavaScript. And if you don't think about it and you have to actively think about it, your app, you know, it, if you forget to handle that error, you know, your app just disappears, and there's like nothing there. Uh, if anyone, you know, for example, wrote a, a React um, application and didn't do a try catch or and didn't handle your error properly, yeah, you just get a blank screen. Um, so at least that will never happen by accident in Rust. Uh, yes. Oh, yeah, so instead of making an entire SPA like I've done here, you mean to like, to host, um, 
like a small U application inside of like a regular application, uh, like HTML file? Is that what you mean? Yeah, I'm not really sure either. Um, I've never experimented with that myself. Yeah. All right, anyone else? Yes. Uh, one more time. Uh, oh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so we asked, is the back-end space ready? Is it production ready? And the answer to that is uh, totally yes. There are several um, frameworks that are even not just at version one, but Actix is at version four. So these are battle-tested frameworks. Uh, they've, they've, been, um, they've been out in the world for a little bit and uh, gone through several iterations. Um, all the features that you would expect to have of a back-end framework, uh, you will have with, well, a minimalist back-end framework, let's put it that way, uh, you will have. Because they're, they're not Ruby on Rails, right? They're more like, um, what's that one called? Uh, Express.js, right? A uh, very minimalist server that you can stick a bunch of plugins into to build something out. But it's not so easy as, you know, you know, type in a simple command line code and everything's wired up and ready to go and you can start building it. You, you really have to wire in a lot of things manually. Um, but the things are there if you need them. Uh, there are good frameworks also for, say, uh, authentication. You can set up JSON web tokens. There's a, a, a pretty good library for uh, role-based access control. So, yeah, I'd say the back end is pretty much ready. Unless you, there might be some niche thing that you're looking for that maybe isn't implemented yet, but the main things that you'd expect to be there are there. Uh, yes? Um, I haven't experimented much with uh, unit testing. And yeah, especially testing async code, I think, would be a challenge. Um, but it's something I would have to look into. Um, I haven't focused much on that yet. Uh, yes? How's the like, VS? Like, does it have anything equivalent to VS Mint or Trivia or something like that? Uh, yeah, so mm -hmm. yeah, so we asked what the developer experience is like. And yeah, I can um, show you that. So we have down here a add-on called Rust Analyzer, um, and that can give us uh, syntax highlighting and errors and stuff. So assuming it's working, uh, sometimes I have to oh, sometimes I have to poke it a little bit to get it running. So let me see. So now it's going to fetch the metadata. It's actually going, it actually uses um, like uh, what cargo check and it's just going to interpret that and try to put it in. So assuming it wakes up, it's got to, again, it's got to compile everything. So it's a little bit slow, but once it's compiled up, it kind of caches things and it's a bit faster. Um, but yeah, getting it running, you know, let's just say it's no ES lint. So there's no like uh, format on save or something like that? Oh, yeah, there is format on save. Um, it's just like, it's not as good as you might think. Um, let's see if we can get the thing to run. Come on, wake up. Is VS Code like the recommended uh, editor for Rust, or does JetBrains offer something better? Or? Um, I don't think JetBrains has anything. Yeah, as you can see, and I've experienced this issue before, this is a major pain point, is sometimes Rust Analyzer just decides not to work, and you have to poke at it a little bit to get it going. And Oh, JetBrains has one? Oh, it's not free? Yeah.
Yeah, VS Code is free. Oh, yeah, VS Code is free, so it has its. Is it working? I think maybe my battery might be going dead. Is flashing. it green? Oh. It's flashing red and. Uh, All right, let me give you another one. But yeah, the uh, the DX and VS Code can sometimes leave a little bit to be desired, uh, as, as you can see. Um, I probably at least once a week I have this issue where just Rust Analyzer quits working and I have to like run like maybe Cargo Clean or something like that to wake it up, and it, it's a pain. Yeah. <laughs> but thanks for letting us know about the uh, JetBrains one uh, because I think I might look into that in the future. All right, any other questions? All right, another one? Uh, in the browser? Um, I haven't tried it, but I would think so, because at the end of the day, like, well, actually, hmm. Yeah, when it comes to Wasm, I'm not really sure, because Wasm really, it, you know, it compiles down, and all the browser knows is, what your, you know, what the WASM file that it's received, and maybe source mapping hasn't been like implemented yet. I haven't even tried it, tried it yet. But uh, yeah, that that would potentially be a big pain point for a front end developer, I think. All right, if that's all. If there are no other questions, then I'm going to jump in here because I'd like to know a little more about you. Uh, oh. So, how long have you been doing front end? Or, sorry, full stack development. Uh, so I'm relatively new to this space, actually. I've been doing it for about three years. Um, yeah, I uh, got recommended to it by a friend who said it was awesome, and it was, and uh, I never want to go back. And how long have you been learning Rust? Uh, about one year. Uh, yeah, I just heard it was hard to learn, and I decided, well, you know, it sounds like a challenge. Uh, that sounds like a pretty good mindset to me. Are there any other uh, pieces of technology that you're excited about, that you're learning about at the moment? Um, hmm. Well, I guess the, the something that just caught my attention is something called WASI. Uh, has anyone heard of WASI? OK, we have a few, right? So WASI is the WebAssembly System Interface. And it's, like an, it's not really a technology itself, it's a specification, but it's a specification for WebAssembly to allow to have a common standard for WebAssembly runtimes that operate outside the browser so that they can all interface consistently with the host machine. Think of it like Docker without the container. Um, it's basically going to enable like you to write code that can basically run anywhere like Java, except it's native, almost. It sounds like it might be big for, I don't know, secure execution environments, uh, crypto stuff, yeah, and smart contracts. Th that's exactly right. In fact, one of the big use cases for um, WASI, from what I've heard, is they're basically, one of the main goals of it is security. Basically, you have the sandbox that your WASM application runs in, and the only permissions that the WASM application has access to are things that are given to it by the sandbox. So this kind of solves the problem of executing like potentially dangerous external code. Because, um, you know, currently, like say if you download some JavaScript or whatever and run it, like basically the computer says, um, well, the, uh, the application, your, your JavaScript application says to the computer, hey, um, I'm Brian, I I'm came here from Brian, Brian sent me, and please give me access to all of his passwords and also a network connection, you know. Uh, and um, this kind of reverses that and instead, like, you say, hey, here's this application that I want to run. He can only have this permission. Um, so yeah, that it is a good potential for like kind of revolutionizing how we do, um, how, how we manage like external foreign untrusted code. Uh, well, I'm also out of questions. So thank you for giving this very detailed presentation on full stack web dev. Uh, just one more question. Oh, yes. One more thing I wanted to ask you is, um, what's a topic that you would like to hear about that you could recommend for future presenters? Hmm, a topic that I'd like to hear about. Well, one that I think would be really interesting uh, to hear would be to find somebody who has never programmed in Rust before and to have them sit down 
and maybe in a month try to learn it and produce anything and then talk about what it was like. Uh, because we always hear that, that Rust is very, uh, has a steep learning curve, right? Um, and it would be interesting to hear from someone who's really fresh off that. So if there's anyone here who has never written Rust before and wants to try, I'd love to hear you talk about that. That sounds like a great idea to me. Uh, we should try to make that happen. So anybody here who's, uh, this is your first time at the Rust meetup? Raise your hand. Oh, a, a lot of people. And uh, if you've been here before, have you been here at the previous uh, event in, uh, it was on October 11th, I believe? Raise your hand. Okay, so there's fewer people, but if you remember, like I always say the same thing, is basically it's uh, the bottleneck is finding good presenters, people who want to present. And believe it or not, uh, Brian actually approached me after the last meetup, right? Mm. So you had less than three weeks to prepare for this. Yeah, pretty much. I just sat so down and coded out something as fast as I could in my free time for the, I honestly, I spent a lot more time working on the, the, the sample applications. That was more fun than writing a <laughs> PowerPoint, but uh, yeah. That sounds about right to me. So it's, I just wanted to highlight this as a, as an example of uh, next time, this could be you. Just let me know if you want to present about anything that's even remotely related to Rust. Um, and feel free to message me if there's a specific topic that you'd love to hear about. Uh, I know what I want to hear about. I'm really interested lately in compiling Rust to sort of heterogeneous systems, like let's say you have a GPU and you want to program the GPU in the same language they use for the CPU. I think that would be pretty cool for games. I think there are a couple of experiments with systems like that. I would love to hear about that if anybody knows about that. <laughs> if not, then I'm happy to hear about anything else, really. Anyway, uh, the food is here, so we don't want to eat cold pizza. We're going to wrap up. Thank you for coming, and we'll see you at the next one. Hopefully in December, if we can secure a venue, it's kind of difficult. Everything is packed. So if you know you can recommend a venue, please shoot me a message on LinkedIn or just email. And if December doesn't happen, then we surely have January 17th cut out for us. So enjoy socializing, enjoy the pizza and the beer. And if you don't mind staying a little bit, we, just a reminder, we need to get this area back to its original state by 8.30. Otherwise, WeWork is gonna be really, really angry with us. And we don't want that because we have great hosts. So thank you. And for anyone who wants to get a closer look at the code, it's on my GitHub. Um, I'm Toad Slop, and uh, it's full stack Rust demo. So yeah, feel free to check it out if you want. Um, yeah, enjoy some pizza. I stay at one, grab two. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, thanks for coming out.